the third week of November 2019, and this is Foragers Locally Sourced. Nanak Region News Current Events Video Blog. I'm Carter Hammond, host and producer. Tonight, we've got an interview with Michelle Russell. She's an activist and organizer, Conval grad, who's recently been involved in helping to get the project going to get solar on the roof at the high school. Uh, we'll be talking about the Sharon Arts Center conversation uh, that just happened this past week. We'll talk about uh, Democrats' big wins across the state as the GOP is struggling to deal with their identity crisis over support or not support for the Trump administration. Andrew Walensky speaks at the Mariposa Museum. First, though, I want to talk about a local lawyer and Democrat, state, former, uh, former state senator, former candidate for governor, Mark Fernald, has come out and endorsed Pete Buttigieg for president. Uh, his press release reads as follows. Pete Buttigieg is the best candidate for the Democratic Party and the candidate best suited to serve as the next president of the United States. Pete stands as the perfect foil to Donald Trump, young, energetic, and eloquent. But more than that, Pete is able to speak to people across the political spectrum and unite all of us around common sense solutions to our biggest problems. We saw that clearly at the la- the latest debate on issues like health care and gun control. He understands the ultimate goal is universal health coverage, but he recognizes there is more than one way to achieve that goal. Rather than getting bogged down in unproductive partisan fights, Pete is putting forward bold policies that the majority of Americans have been calling for. Here's the thing. Buttigieg just recently has faced a ton of backlash for his, not only did he use a Kenyan woman to promote this uh, email flyer that he had sent out to gain support for the Douglas plan, but it also created an opt-out mechanism that saw prominent black figures in the South endorsing Pete Buttigieg as the candidate, not Pete Buttigieg's Doug- Douglas, Pete Buttigieg's Douglas plan. <laughs> wow. It's staggering to me because he's pulling it less than 1% with black voters nationwide anyways. And then to pull a stunt like this is just absurd. You, and you running for president? What if you I, truly running for president and you black people to vote for you? You don't got to vote. What if You running for president and you want black people to vote for you? you that's a downfall. That's not going to happen. I'm not asking for your vote. You ain't going to get it either. He's taken very conservative talking points against Medicare for all. It's just better than Medicare for all, whether you want it or not. And I don't understand why you believe the only way to deliver affordable coverage to everybody is to obliterate private plans, kicking 150 million Americans off of their insurance in four short years. The reason I insist on Medicare for all who want it as the strategy to deliver on that goal we share of universal health care is that that is something that, as a governing strategy, we can unify the American people around, creating a version of Medicare, making it available to anybody who wants it, but without the divisive step of ordering people onto it, whether they want to or not. And I believe that commanding people to accept that option, whether we wait three years, as Senator Warren has proposed, or whether you do it right out of the gate, is not the right approach to unify the American people around a very, very big transformation that we now have an opportunity to deliver. He has in the past spoken favorably of the Tea Party. I have to admit as a Democrat that many of my friends and supporters uh, looked at me as if I was absolutely nuts when I suggested that uh, I would be coming tonight to speak with a group that's often identified with the Tea Party. Uh, there are some, especially in my party, that think that the Tea Party is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Republican Party. Uh, but there are many others who believe that the Tea Party is motivated by real concerns about the direction of our government and the responsiveness of our government to citizens, and above all, a frustration with business as usual. Uh, that is what motivated me to run. And so while we may come from often very different perspectives, uh, I believe... So... I understand what Mark means when he says that Pete is young and energetic and eloquent, but the fact of the matter is that might be all he is. When it comes to policy, there's nothing particularly refreshing about what Pete says. It's all the same line that we've heard from any other centrist candidate. It's not really that different than what Biden says. 
is not that different than what Obama said. And we all saw exactly what happened to Obama when he got into office. Most of the incredibly progressive change platform uh, points that he stood on, he wasn't able to hold to because he came to the table compromised. Well, Buttigieg is running on the compromised position. So he really is the boomer candidate. He's he's ticking all of the identity boxes while still playing to the exact same favorability ratings that they knew many, many years ago when they were voting. And it does not do anything to acknowledge that Buttigieg polls around fourth or fifth amongst millennial voters. Mark has spoken using very progressive language in the past. I want to see, and I will work for a future in New Hampshire, where the elderly people are not taxed out of their homes. I will fight for a future where young families can afford, afford houses. I will fight for a future where poor towns have well-funded schools so that their kids have the same chance as the kids in the property-rich towns. I will fight for a future where we will properly fund mental health treatment, opioid treatment, the disabled, environmental protection, because that's where the future lies. But unfortunately, I hear many of the same points in what Mark says as what I hear from Pete. And I can't help but feel that while this endorsement is a perfect matchup, it sends a signal to voters in this town that if they want to continue holding to progressive values, that this may not be the endorsement that they want to take a cue from. So, recently information surfaced that placed Rudy Giuliani along with Lev Parnas and Igor Fruman with Eddie Edwards, the former GOP candidate who ran against Chris Pappas. Now, Edwards seems to be mulling over another run uh, this coming time around. Uh, and, you know, being seen with a bunch of people who have since been arrested for their involvement in the U.S.-Ukraine debacle. <sighs> Not a great look. Especially when we also have Victoria Sullivan, who just recently ran against Joyce Craig, meeting with Giuliani as well. Jason Chaffetz meeting Sununu in the, the, the office of the governor. He's also meeting with Corey Lewandowski. So these are fairly direct ties to Trump associates amongst a, a range of... New Hampshire politicians and GOP. That can be tough to pair when you have opinion pieces like the October 4th one from USA Today written by state GOP, former state GOP chair Jennifer Horn stating clear opposition from inside the GOP to the recent behavior from Trump. Under any previous president, Thursday's brazen comments would have been met with Republican outrage. President Barack Obama would have been inundated with calls for impeachment by Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and congressional Republicans. President George W. Bush would have faced the ire of the conservative base. Yet all of these so-called principled people stand silent as the pres president sells the integrity of American elections to the foreign country with the best opposition research team. Paired with that and Sununu saying stuff like this... Um. Look, Washington is a circus. I, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn there. I think I'm in the vast majority of Americans, both Republican and Democrat, that agree with the fact that Washington just doesn't get anything done. They're more consumed about uh, political grandstanding and all that than actually moving the ball forward. I mean, ask the American people, how many quality accomplishments has Congress actually gotten done in the last few years? Very little. And so I'm not, I'm not saying that the issue of impeachment isn't serious. Of course it is. But you know how it's being gone about, all the information that we have, the whistleblower report, who is the whistleblower? If there's something serious there, then that person has to be heard, they need to be protected, and they should have a, a process for that. But at the same time, I, I just don't think many people are putting a lot of, of, of weight into it because it's a little like um, the boy who cried wolf. It's really hard for them to have their cake and eat it too when it comes to enjoying the private attention of Trump associates and Trump admin insiders while simultaneously trying to distance themselves from the noise in Washington, D.C.
local elections just happened. Democrats have taken power in many seats across the state. Uh, moderators, aldermen, select boards, mayors, school boards. It was a big sweep. Uh, they did run more candidates than the conservatives. They ran 324 compared to the Republican 157 in 365 races. So there was a lot of coverage and they really ran everywhere and showed a strong result. You can see that in places like Laconia towns that elected a Democrat yet went 13 points to Trump. We see the Democrats taking over two thirds of those seats uh, that they ran for and uh, Eight of those Democrats are first timers. 19 of them are young Democrats. So it's, it's a big, it's a big move. And it would insinuate that there might still be some momentum coming off of the, the 2018 blue wave going into 2020. The GOP was pretty silent about this on the day of the elections. They mostly focused on Tamara Lay of Northampton saying a bunch of things that were very controversial about school choice and religious schools. So they were mostly focused on just, you know, trying to get a bunch of signatures together to morally oppose her and just they they wanted her off of the committee or whatever. But they mostly focused on that, and they mostly focused on just retweeting Sununu going around the state doing whatever he was doing that day. That's not a great look for Sununu when he's saying things like he's not worried about any of the people running against him. Are either these candidates scare you at all? <laughs> no, no, really, absolutely not. But we do now see the Democratic field taking shape with... Dan Feltis and Andrew Valinsky both announced um, and out here doing their campaigning. We've already got attack ads against them. So I will not take the pledge uh, if I conclude it's appropriate for me to run for office. You know, New Hampshire does have a revenue problem, not a spending problem. And I don't think it's fiscally prudent to automatically take off the table any revenue option. If you physically take off the table any revenue option. Um, the RGA, the Republican Governors Association, has run the same attack ad against both of us, saying that we're tax and spending liberals. He's taking the pledge. I'm not. And we can likely expect to or could potentially expect to see a return of former uh, governor candidate Steve Marchand, uh, who has at times expressed interest and been relatively ambiguous about whether or not he would run for governor in 2020. Please keep in mind that if you do not win, you do not get to lead. And these are the times where we make those decisions. Uh, I, uh, I'll make a decision a little later in the process about what I'm going to do in 2020. However, he is out there making a lot of money working for Andrew Yang currently. If Andrew Yang were to not get the nomination and Steve were re- to return to the state and go for that run, we could likely see a similar breakdown to what we see in the 2020 races, uh, or the 2020 primary at the very least, where we've got a division between sort of the the left libertarians that are taking uh, voters towards people like Yang and Gabbard. We've got the more progressive wing that would go towards the Warren or the Sanders. And we also have the more establishment wing. Now that would put you in the in the vein of Marchand representing your, your Yang type Volinsky representing your more Sanders Warren type and Feltis representing your Buttigieg Biden type. Obviously, these are not direct correlations. I can't say that they would have the same platforms. They're all individual people. They all have their own positions. But there's a there's a high likelihood that they would be pulling from these different constituencies and divides. I'll be doing comparisons As things go on, as people release more details, as I have more things to cross compare. So look forward to more coverage about the Democratic primary in the state. Andrew Valinsky was at the Mariposa Museum this past Sunday. He's 
spoke just generally about his platform, took a bunch of questions from folks. Uh, he, I'll, I'll just, I'll just hop right into some clips and, um, I'm just going to let, I'm going to let some of these run for a little bit, but I, I'll, I'll stop and hop back in a second because there's one particular clip where he's talking about the environment that he, he makes a very particular call out and I, I want to call some attention to that. So, so here he is sort of talking about his broad plan and then here's, here he is sort of talking about the, 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 the granite, uh, the Granite Bridge pipeline and the environmental effects of that. So we'll just we'll we'll play these few clips up and then I'll I'll talk about it a little bit after that. When we organized the campaign, Amy and I, and we had some staff here uh, and people we consulted with, we did it around four pillars, um, four basic foundational pieces. Uh, that's education, climate action, healthcare and income inequality. Those are the four pillars of our campaign. We're in a time of climate emergency. There was an article last week that 11,000 scientists signed on to making clear how drastic the problem is. The time for half measures is gone. We need quick, direct action. We need to fight for clean air and clean water. I admit, when I think of climate and environmental challenges, I think of them as a grandfather. I see this and worry about the world we're leaving our children and our grandchildren. And so one specific example of how I'd approach this is Liberty Utilities would like to build a pipeline. It's called a Granite Bridge. It's a for-profit fracked gas pipeline to run from the seacoast to Epping. And if I have any say, no problem. So if we have eight to 10 years to bend the curve on carbon pollution, why would you build a pipeline that's gonna have ratepayers paying for it for 20 or 30 years? It doesn't make economic sense. If you complain about the industrial pollution of our water here in New Hampshire, and you have every right to complain about it, how hypocritical is it? to support fracking that destroys the water in the communities where the fracking occurs. So for both reasons, I oppose Granite Bridge and it won't happen on my watch. He's kind of calling out Mindy Mesmer right there because Mindy Mesmer uh, is very well known, especially in the south of the state, but statewide really, for being a champion for clean water and bringing a... a absurd amount of attention to the PFAS con- contamination out in Ryan on the coast uh, near the Pease Air Force Base. So, and I mean, and that's affecting multiple towns now to the point where they're, none of their drinking water is safe. Um, this is, it, it's happening across the south of the state. So she's very, very conscious about water safety, but she's also endorsed Dan Feltis as governor and Dan Feltis has shown support for the Granite Bridge pipeline. Now, if we want to take a minute and look at pipelines, well, just recently news came out that, oh, guess what? Dakota Access Pipeline is spilling. So, I, and, and it had been reported for months on Democracy Now! that that was going to happen. The pipeline faced months of massive resistance from the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, members of hundreds of other indigenous tribes from across the Americas, as well as non-Native allies. From the very beginning, we asked the Corps of Engineers, uh, what impact will this pipeline have on our people? And the Corps of Engineers never could answer that. Uh, their response is, we're doing an environmental assessment, and we're going to uh, see what impact it will have on the en- environment. And it, there's no impact. Uh, that's, their, that's what they state. There were leaks even before it went operational? Yes, there Can were. Can you explain what that means? It wasn't operational. So yeah, how were there leaks? They, they start putting pipeline, like where the valves, to test the valves, they put oil through the pipelines and um, it leaks significant amounts, even though it was a test. So we understood and we knew that there were going to be leaks. So we've beaten down pipelines repeatedly in this state before, and I do not understand why we continue to try to do this again. 
people in the States clearly seem to understand that this is not good. And it's just further baffling to see such a champion of progressive values in the state come out and support a candidate that is support also supportive of a project that d- runs directly antithesis. In these next clips, Valinsky's uh, going to be talking about sort of the he's not taking the pledge. Um, he's also been pretty direct about the fact that he's not supportive of an income tax, as he'll say in the following clips. And um, but he also puts out some interesting proposals as to to what he would do or be open to instead. So we'll take a look at those. How do you respond when you get challenged on the pledge? So the start for me is, how's that property tax working for you now? Yeah. Right? So force the other one to defend the system, because it isn't serving any of us, and every one of us has seen our property taxes go up and up and up. So that's an easy response. The second response really is more for our side. If you take the pledge, you can't say half the things I've already said this afternoon. You can't start pushing back. And and to be clear, the pledge doesn't mean I'm in favor of an income tax. I actually don't think, with respect to Mark, that an income tax is the right answer. Um, Mitt Romney, who owns a big old mansion, $10 million on the lake, He's never going to pay an income tax here. He doesn't work here and he doesn't live here. And I think Mitt Romney should pay his fair share. And so there are other methodologies that make more sense in that context. So you could fix the school funding system based on the statewide property tax. You wouldn't probably want to do it all on that, but that's one option. You can instill features of an income tax in a statewide property tax, so you can make it income sensitive to protect people who don't have large incomes. You could exempt, for example, the first $50,000 of value of a home. Um, So if you have a $150,000 house, that means you get taxed on $100,000. That's a big difference. If you have a million dollar house and they give you the first 50,000 off, it's inconsequential. We already have a sales tax in New Hampshire. We just call it rooms and meals, right? Um, We already have an income tax. It's called interest and dividends. The business enterprise tax is what? A tax on the wages that a business pays out. So in some ways, it's an income tax and it gets paid whether or not the business is profitable. You happen to be sitting right behind the proponent of a capital gains tax. Um, which is another way of getting at um, an uh, income-based tax. So there are options, and we should keep all of them on the table. Now, I think this is kind of interesting because he's, he's taking a very pragmatic approach uh, when it comes to looking at, at, at these tax issues. Um, and he's definitely trying to be sensitive to the fact that a lot of people just when they hear income tax and and that even happened in the meeting um but generally speaking it it shows a certain flexibility and you know to say that you want to make the property tax sensitive to income like come on that's a no brainer dude we should that should have happened a long time ago his point about all those governors taking the pledge and that's why they couldn't get anything done i mean That's just true. It's just straight up true. So that's certainly a a large source of the stagnation. So there was a third community conversation held at Bass Hall this past week. Uh, It was moderated by Kieran Nagel and so the speakers were Roy Schlieben, Jessica Gelter, Paul Tuller, Kim Asbury, and Kate Dean. They all sort of gave their individual takes. Jess shared uh, information related to a survey that Arts Alive had put out to artists in the area asking what their needs were and what they were looking for. People had specifically stated that there was no space, not appropriate space, 
or uh, just not available in the area. Um, so I think that, you know, and that, that speaks to the difficulty that people have finding adequate spaces to do things like what Sharon Arts is. A lot of the, you know, a lot of the requests really just focused on people wanting more space for artists to, to do their thing, whether it's work or whether it's show work. Um, one of the solutions proposed for showing work was to do more pop-up galleries and vacant commercial spaces throughout town. So that's just sort of a one-off thing. And most of the things that we were discussing at this meeting were in that vein of, of um, you know, getting the word out about the, the figure drawing class that's happening bi-weekly at the Makerspace. It just happens past Tuesday. Stuff like uh, Makerspace will be setting up classes starting, I believe, in January at... Uh, you know, locations around the area, like libraries, vacant spaces like that, that are capable of hosting. Um, and they'll be doing a variety of different classes. They haven't announced them yet. Uh, I know that they do have some teachers lined up that have agreed to do it. Um, and they're just, they're just going for it. So that's something that can definitely be looked forward to. Uh, <laughs> So it's, um, you know, there was still, there, there, there was still an interest expressed in one sort of specific centralized location. Um, but it was pointed out that, you know, we shouldn't wait around for somebody to come along with a whole bunch of money and just give it to us. Um, we need to take action now and we need to do little things to move forward. So, some things that had been put out there were uh, Max Makerspace taking some steps to work with Avenue 18 Center out of uh, Antrim to get a better connection with the the youth in the area and to reach out to Rivermead and Scott Frere or the retirement, any other t retirement community elements to try and sort of develop those relationships. I can't speak to where those developments are currently. I hope to have some actual first-hand, you know, information from the people that are putting this together. So I'll, uh, I'll look to have some more content like that in the next few episodes coming up. But generally speaking, it, to put emphasis there is to, again, put emphasis on the community building aspects and to promote the, the positive mental health effects that, paying attention to having a healthy arts community in our area produces. It had been mentioned by Jess Gelter that there were some participants in the survey that had stated that they didn't believe there was any market for their work at all in the area, which brings up the question of what kind of market do we have here and where does the art industry stand in terms of its relationship to supply and demand currently? Um, how much are we producing? Where is it being consumed? Is it happening here locally? Why isn't it happening here locally? Questions like this are, are, are important for us to ask because it helps us to decide exactly what type of galleries we want to try and you know, roll out or make happen in town. It'll help us understand what will be successful and what won't be successful so that we don't waste time and we do the thing that's best for the community. So it's, while it may very well be a, a wise decision to try and be inclusive to all artists, and we speak that way in town already. We talk about how we support the arts, but generally speaking, I don't know if we support all the arts all the time. And we are very, very particular in the type of work that we like to spend money on. And in this area, most of what you'll go and you'll see in galleries around our, you know, you know, realist or impressionist landscape paintings and, you know, that mid-century style and Americana. And it's just... It, 
look, it's a great region to collect antiques, but we do not need to make our art look old too. That's just my opinion, man. But if that's the type of art that we want and we don't, we really just like, we know that nobody else is ever going to want any of that. Like we should be drawing that line and we should be clear about it now. It isn't going to be healthy for us to be trying to invite young artists that are doing more avant-garde or, uh, you know, alternative style art, things that would be very, very different from what we're accustomed to here. It's not good for us to be sending signals to them that we want them here when there's really nothing for them to do in this area. So it's just something that would be wise for us to keep in mind as we go on and develop this and what's right for the community. Paul Toller said something really important during that that talk and I think it was it was the most important thing that anybody said the entire evening which was be patient think years uh this isn't gonna happen overnight it's not gonna happen next week and it's not gonna happen next month it probably won't happen six months from now and it might not have happened a year from now Building these things takes time it took time for the Sharon Arts Center to become the monolith in the area that it was they went through a lot of struggle. So to say that this is just something that we can we can throw up and make happen is not being honest with ourselves about what we need to do and the actions we as a community need to take if we want our arts community to continue to thrive. Many people that participated really wanted to make things work. We saw a lot of uh, space managers... Uh, people that have gallery space express a willingness to want to communicate with each other so they can share the the artists that are coming to them and looking to show work. This would help a lot. It's about each of us as individuals taking that step to get involved and do that next thing, to push the arts community forward and help fill that hole that's left behind by the Sharon Arts Center. Here is my interview with Michelle Russell. Uh, Again, she's done a lot of work to get the Conval Solar Project in front of the school board, which just passed a vote to continue looking into it, uh, take the next steps to initiate the project. All in favor? So she and I are going to, you know, we'll, we'll show interview footage right now of us just talking this out and getting into some of the more detailed stuff about this and also just talking about, you know, being a, a, a 30 something in Peterborough after having graduated and left and coming back and just, you know, and, and what we can expect environmentally going down the line. So uh, I hope you guys enjoy the interview. For anyone who doesn't have any idea of what this is at all, like say you didn't read the article in the paper, what happened? So last Tuesday night, um, November 5th, there was a full school board meeting and they voted to task the superintendent with moving forward with negotiating and signing a letter of intent to pursue a solar project at Conval High School. Um, I've been working with many different people in the community, including the Peterborough Energy Committee, um, lots of others as well, to try to put together a project um, at the high school that 
is sort of the biggest it can be with still making a financial sense and educational sense and so forth. And so I and many others have been going to school board meetings, particularly the Budget and Property Committee, for over 18 months now, going to them and asking the question, what what is preventing a solar project from moving forward? Because I'm not the first person to bring this to them. They've had three proposals yeah, I can imagine in the past that's five the years. Yeah. Um, and every time after someone came and presented and said, this is a great idea, they said, yeah, it's a great idea. We'll talk about it more. And then, then and it was then never just, a top priority. That's, man, that's like... Which I've is had, frustrating for yeah. me because I think it is a priority. <laughs> it's so funny. I've had conversations with people lately, like not to get, uh, like not to veer off topic, but like I've had so many conversations with people lately about how not just like this community, but like maybe like the state and the region as a whole, we have this tendency to like, well, yeah, like let's talk about it. Let's wait and see what happens. We'll figure it out. And then like, 20 years later, we're still talking about the same issues. So yeah. that, I don't know, just you saying that really reminded me of that. So <laughs> so what did you, as in So like, basically, a, yeah. I said, I'm a student who went here. I think it would be great to move forward on this. And I'm curious, like, what are the barriers that existed that prevented this from happening? Is there anything that I or anyone else can do to help find a solution to actually make a project happen? And okay. they said, well, keep kicking us. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they said, okay, about, about six months in, they said, if you show us a project that doesn't cost anything up front, that costs less than we're currently doing, that is on the roof so there won't be vandalism, and that is of value to students, then we'll consider it. Okay. Which seemed like a, a pretty big task. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's but at the very least, it gave you restrictions. But it gave like, us really important restrictions. Like that might yeah. that boy probably was more than anybody else ever got. Like oh yeah, it was several months in before they gave us those restrictions. It's weird because that all fit into one sentence. It's so funny how it was so hard one, to just be like, here's the problems. Like right. um, yeah. So basically, everybody on the school board is very money conscious and doesn't think anything can happen that's going to cost extra tax money, which I think is fiscally responsible and good. Um, but at the same time, I'm coming from an environmental science perspective where I'm really worried about climate change and the intergovernmental plan panel on climate change saying we have maybe 10 years, 12 years to totally change I actually looked systems. that up after uh, yeah. after I had spoken to you outside the townhouse that day, and that was like I remember looking at the stats and just being like, "Wow! Like I wish more people would read this." Yeah, um, like that's which they a won't. lot to do fast. So yeah. for me, I'm really excited about the thought of a project at the high school that um, number one cuts down carbon emissions and doesn't cost anything, but number two is kind of an educational project for the whole region of, okay, this is solar, it's possible, it's cost effective now, students can be learning about it, there can be technical education associated it, with it, there can be climate education associated with it, and so it can be really more of like a teaching project than Okay, I than see, yeah, else. yeah, I, that's, that's a good yeah. sell, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, I think that's a really good right. way to sell something and, in this area. Um, supposedly, the U.S. Bureau of Labor says solar and wind are the top two career fields that are expanding. So if you're a high school looking at how to prepare your students for the modern world, it seems pretty clear to me that... Yeah, um, if you're eyeballing what the new job market is going to be... That would be right. something you'd want to think about. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, um, well, yeah. that's that's good. So is, does that describe... Yeah, uh, yeah, no, I mean, that does. That gives, that gives that, that gives good context that it's like, so this is something that we've been trying to do for a while just to yeah. get us, like, get it moved over and yeah. it's just, for whatever reason, been held up because town bureaucracy... Because there's other priorities. I think there were... <laughs> The school board was really stretched tight with the thought of figuring out, is one of the schools going to be closed? Are several of the schools going to be closed? Which yep. ones will stay open? Um, but the high school seems like a pretty safe bet that that will stay open for a while <laughs> yet. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, in, in an ideal world, I would love to see this happening at other schools, too. Um, 
and I guess we'll see what happens. If this project's successful, there's no reason that other so there schools was, couldn't do this too. Yeah, I noticed that um, they were saying in the in the original reporting on this that yeah. there was there were 33 other schools in the state, I think, that have... Yeah, there's 32 or 33 schools and universities in New Hampshire. Okay. Um, when we first went to the meetings and said... Um, why won't Commonwealth consider this? Yeah. We put together a list of all the schools in the state that had done it so far and sort of what savings they were seeing. Um, just to say that you're not breaking totally new ground. Other people have done this before. Right. Um, maybe we should consider it too. Sure, sure. Yeah. So, and now, like, as far as the actual paying for it goes, how does yeah. that all work? Like, like not, I guess not right. just like the installation, but also long term. Yeah. Like the other question I would have is like, how much power is that putting out? Yeah. How much of that power supplies the actual school with power? Does it, do we break even on that? Um, and yeah. then obviously there's more like questions beyond that. Like, okay, let's say we're kicking back into the grid. Like what does right. the contract with, the company revision say about that and then also you know i'm i'm sure that there's net metering issues with yeah. that as well so right. um yeah yeah. I'm, yeah so the project is 300 kilowatts it's probably close to a third of the electricity used by the school which okay. is I mean, it'd be great if it was more, but sure. the school is still um, considering several efficiency upgrades, including transitioning to LED lighting. I think only about 15% of the lights in the school have been tr switched already, and that's about a two-year payback. So I'm hoping that they'll think about doing that too. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. And we had the student council do a lighting inventory to basically get a sense of how much that was. Basically, we're trying to be really responsible and say, like, we're going to look at all the different aspects of this so that we know the parameters for the project. So um, part of that is because the economics are a lot better at this point if the electricity that's produced is used behind the meter. Okay. So what we did is we were able to collaborate with the energy broker for the school district and get 15-minute increment data from Eversource and graph that compared to what the average solar production would look like for a project of this size. Okay, that's and, those are intelligent data points to put next to each yeah. other. Yeah, um, and so basically 80% of the electricity produced would be used behind the meter. And why that's important is because if it's used behind the meter, it's not subject to being sold back to the grid, and it's not subject to distribution and transmission costs. The way right. net metering works now is it's sold back to the grid at a wholesale rate, and then when you pull it off the grid, you're paying a retail rate. So you're like basically, so basically you're paying more for your own paying energy. Paying more for the electricity you pr you pull back. And so yeah. it's, it's kind of a net loss. Right. But anything that you use behind the meter, you don't have to pay for all of the costs of um, electricity lines and anything associated with transmission and distribution. Okay. So that makes it approximately, I think this is right, um, <laughs> eight cents compared to like 11 cents. Okay. So 11 cents would be the all-in price of um, supply and distribution from the grid. Eight cents would be the price of solar produced behind the meter at the school. So, and that's that's like, we would hit that eight cents and then, and then basically be buying the difference to the 11? Um, well, the difference between the 11 would be the savings to the district over okay. time. Right, right, okay. Um, that makes sense. So, um, yeah. Cool. Anyhow, so that's a little bit about size and supply. And yeah. Do you no, have more that, questions about that? Um, no, I mean, I think that's that definitely covers okay. covers it on that. Um, yeah. I think, you know, my my next question would be like, okay, so um, as far as like the business angle of it, right. um, I'm trying to think how like uh, like one of my right wing friends would word this to me, just so that I can yeah. like cover the base. Um, like, how do we know that we can trust this corporation that's going to come and do this work? I guess. Yeah. Is the that's yeah. If I was if I were to ask like you know the libertarian right. friend question like what like how can I trust these people? Right. 
Well, we know that 22 of the 33 schools in New Hampshire are working with them. So that means that other people think that they have been trustworthy enough to do that. Um, and they're an employee-owned business based out of New England, New Hampshire, Maine, and Vermont. They've um, done a full certification to become a B Corp, which okay. is yeah. People, Planets, Profit, all in the same level field. So um, which profits like, are not put over people, which yeah. tends to make you think that they'd be fair. They've also won um, like top New England solar installer and just, I think... Oh, I can't remember the name of the publication, but like Solar World. Sure. They've also been chosen in the past couple of years as number one business in New Hampshire Business Review. So based on all these things, it, it seems like they're, they're a pretty like, good choice. They're a pretty solid choice. And, okay. and the reason that we want to go with them is because they're the only ones who have set up this um, impact investor model. And why that's important is because right now there's a, a 30% federal tax credit for solar. And municipalities, schools, and nonprofits can't take advantage of that. But investors can. So if there are investors who think that installing solar is a good idea, they can take that their tax burden and they can take the tax credit on that and include that as part of the savings to the district. So okay. they take a lower interest rate, but they take a tax credit. Okay. And so they're able to pass that on. They're also able to do a six-year rapid depreciation, which means that at year six, the school district has the option. They don't have to, but they could buy it from the investors at a greatly reduced price. Okay. And yeah. so it's basically a model that's working with people who think this is a good idea, mm -hmm. um, the impact investors, to try to, to make it more affordable Sure. Um, sure. for mm -hmm. municipalities or school districts to do right. this kind of thing. And then long term, it gives them the option to just completely take it off of their yeah. hands and own it completely. Right. And okay. so our school district's really um, concerned about risk and risk management and trying to do as much as they can. So I don't know if at year six they would think, we'll just let the impact investors continue to own it and pay insurance on it and not be responsible for it. Mm hmm and just buy electricity from them for less than we would buy it from um, our third party electric supplier. Right. So they might choose to do that, but the savings so much greater that almost all of the other schools in the state are just like getting a bond and the financing is less. And so they're saving more and they're, they're using that money because districts are always short for money. Right. Um, yeah. 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 Which, and I mean, that's a totally different conversation. Like, <laughs> totally. Cause we can have like, <laughs> We could get into it with the whole, like, oh, here's your one-time check, like, you know, right. so that, I, I mean, yeah. and that's not sustainable, and I, you know. Right. Um, there, Yeah, there's definitely a lot of people that I want to talk to about that as well that, like, are, you know, more specifically involved with the whole, like, I, I've, I spoke with Karen Hatcher a little yeah. bit about it, and, okay. like, I know that she's really involved with that whole side of things, but it's just, it's, it's interesting to see where they crossover you know what i mean like where we're you know like where what crosses over i guess like the 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 like education funding versus mm. like trying to improve our schools to save money on something like power or you right. know what i mean it's like right it's this weird right. you have to spend money to make money or save money in that case right. type of a situation and i it's yeah it, it reminds me a right. lot of what you were saying about the led switch where you have to constantly optimize to yeah. make the to to get the most of it, so it's just right. Um, but at the same time, there are bonds that you can get, and the financing is pretty low interest. Right. So, I think in a way, it's a false choice of saying we have to spend all this money in one chunk. Right. Um, we don't have to. We we Nobody could. Has, yeah. Um, it's really up to us and sort of how we want to do the finances we think as yeah. a district or I guess I just but, the, the thing that's interesting to me about it is yeah. is having to deal with like the one time money and like right. and then having to debate a, you know like we it sounds like the conservative nature of the district yeah. and like the risk assessment aspects right. of things are a direct result of basically never having money and not really knowing where the next money is going to come from absolutely yeah um, um. 
But we do have fixed monthly costs, fixed yearly costs. Right. And if we can make those costs less, then the budget that we have can go further. Sure. So. And it sounds like and it, <laughs> it sounds like from what you're saying that not only are you guys trying to introduce something new that would save the cost, but you're also suggesting like a. Again, not to hard back right. on it, but the LED like right. updating things yeah. within the school itself that are like that smaller would be fixes. That's really big cost savings. Right. That could save more than ten thousand a year after year two. Right. And it takes one like one full year to pay back. So sure. um if if there is funding out there, um, and I think that there is, then all you have to do is secure that funding and then on your three, you're, you're saving a whole lot more. Right. So right. It, it's more work. And I think part of the problem and I think part of the reason it's been slow to move forward is school districts are just so overwhelmed by how much they have to deal with. Yeah. And so adding another piece of work, however big or small that is, um, is overwhelming because there's lots of priorities right. all the time. Um, and so that's where we felt like we could be helpful sure. because we could go in and we could say, we're not on the school board. We don't have all of the other priorities you have. Maybe we can help do some of the homework to try to put together a project that actually won't be so onerous for all of you. Well, and it sounds like it's almost distinctly more trustable because you guys are doing it that way that it's like more of a volunteer and community organization based thing yeah. that's trying to work with, as you pointed out, a B, like certified B Corp, which is a really, it's, it's really hard to get B Corp certification. <laughs> yeah. Like <laughs> really not easy. You have to jump through insane hoops, insane to, hoops. to get that. So that's yeah. a really like, that's a big measure of how good they likely are. Yeah. Um, and I mean, or certifiably are. Um, so the idea that it's like, I would say, I mean, not that objectively <laughs> is a real thing, but objectively speaking, um, that sounds to me like it's probably more trustworthy than, you know, some larger business that's looking to, like, monopolize on power, you know, yeah. and, and, like, and, you know, trying to buy out that stuff and looking right. at schools as, you know, especially schools in a poor state that are struggling and would likely do just about anything to save money right. at this point you know like yeah and I, historically there have been um solar and other renewable energy companies who do offer ppa rates that are much higher mm -hmm. where they might not save as much and sure. um i think in a way that's been part of the challenge is sort of trying to break that um prejudice against old ppas yeah and saying that they don't yeah. all have to be that way right um well, and yeah, I think that's like, and that's something that like, that's a point that I actually like try to drive home on like on this a lot is that it's, you know, like nothing is inherently good or bad. It just is. And it's about what we make it. So mm -hmm. in this instance, it's just about whether or not your goal is to turn a profit or to help people. So right. like... In this particular instance, you're talking about a, an organized community group that's getting together and seeking out a really, you know, certifiably positive company mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, yeah. that like, you know, higher rated company right. coming to us like as we're like putting out bids to be like, how can we save money? Right. Um, and at the very beginning, we were talking about doing an RFP um, process. Mm -hmm putting out a request for proposals and seeing yep. which companies in New England are out there that could do this. But then when we got um, those limitations from the school board budget and property committee, in a way that was kind of setting the parameters for what an RFP would be. And right. they tasked their energy broker to come to our meetings mm -hmm. and to work with us so that we would be getting, putting together a proposal that they would have some kind of trust in mm -hmm. um and so like at the last school board meeting um the people who voted against it one of their concerns is this wasn't an rfp process okay we were asking the board um sign a letter of intent without doing that 
Mm-hmm. And um, that was a big concern to some of them because we didn't put something out to bid. But at the sure. same time, we had worked for more than six months directly with their energy broker. Mm-hmm. Um, and this was really the only <laughs> company that we know of that could offer the financial inv- impact investor model. Right. So, so in a way, it's probably one of the only bids yeah, that would have saying, come in well, to meet I want to bid on something when this would have been the only bidder in the ring anyways based right. off of the restrictions that were dished RFP out. I think some RFP processes, so. if there aren't more than three acceptable bids, then you can't move forward. Right. So in a way, it's just this trying to figure out how to navigate through what I think an RFP makes a lot of sense most of the time. Yeah. But in this particular solution or situation, it might have been more of a complicated tangle. Well, it's also kind of like... Who knows? I don't know. I think, I mean, it's... (laughs) Yeah, it's it's complicated, I guess, but I think about it more in terms... Just because for the sake of trying to, like, explain the full (laughs) idea here. Right. You know, um... Because I think this is something that people get, like, stuck on a lot. Yeah. Um, is they're like, well, you didn't go through this whole bidding process, you know, like, or whatever process they wanted, whatever type of, mm-hmm. you know, forum or what have you. And um, ultimately, the thing is that there was a, a bunch of people that did actual research. Yeah. Like, this isn't just some random decision because somebody is getting a kickback somewhere along the way. Like they're like right. you can go down a line and say, "Oh yeah, these people did this work and they, you know, dug up these facts and we can put it in." So there's right. a different kind like yes, it may ha- be <laughs> coming to us without choice, but we opted to forego the choice because we trust the people in our community to go out and find the right thing for us. Right. Is, right. And we were involved in the process with them for many months. Right. Sort of bringing what we found and talking yep. it through along the way. So it, it's just a different approach, I think. Yeah. And it, so, and that's um, the, the I, I think the main thing is to like, to break out of that, like, oh, it's this insider, like, you know, establishment decision making type stuff. And it's like, well, no. Right. You may be able to make that <laughs> argument on a state or national level, but like here in town or like in our county or our school district or whatever. It's not like that. Like, it's really just like a bunch of moms got together and wanted to do something awesome or, you know, like or yeah. something like that, where it's it's not right. some odd cabal of of highly powered rich people that are trying right. to control yeah. everything. It's like just, students who want to see something good happen at their old school who right. got the idea and decided to do the homework and then pulled in so many other people. It, it was amazing at the meeting on Tuesday. Um, more than 70 people came. And a bunch of students came, and more than 16 people stood up and spoke. Two-minute prepared pieces that were really outstanding. I was so impressed that we That's had awesome. that kind of involvement in our community. Yeah. Yeah, it was really cool. <laughs> and I guess, so just to, like, wrap it around and, yeah. like, ask the last question. So, like, I mean, as somebody who graduated Conval and is still in the area. I mean, we, yeah. we graduated together for, uh, like, know. so, um, <laughs> so like my question for you is like, what's keeping you here? Oh, I love this area. Um, and I love so many of the people I know here. Mm-hmm. Um, it really feels like home mm-hmm. and, um, yeah, I guess I feel like I would rather, be part of making this area the place I really want it to be. It's mm-hmm. so much the place I want it to be already, but there are still, like, I wish we were doing more about climate, for example. Right. So um, I feel like I'll have a, a bigger impact working here than I would just showing up somewhere else in a bigger city Yeah. and trying to do mi- many of the same things. I, I feel like I know a lot of people here and... Um, Maybe know how it works. Connections. I'm I'm getting to know how it works better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, Yeah. And um, I don't know. I've traveled a bit. I've never really totally felt at home in any of the other places I've been. I've totally loved exploring. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. Well, it's just (laughs) I I, I just I I feel like any time I actually have an opportunity. I mean, like most of the people that I've spoken with are like 
you know, 38 or older. Right. And it's just any time that I encounter anybody who's, like, my age or younger, I'm like, okay, why are you here even? Right. Um, and, wh- like, and why do you want to be here? Um, yeah. Because it's... Because so many of our friends have moved away. <laughs> right. Well, there's right? that. And yeah. There's also so much happening in so many other places. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but. But it's you yeah. know at at the same time I mean I think you really like, I think you hit on something like, there that I, relate to really hard which mm-hmm. is like. I feel like I can do something more here than I would be able to do if I were in a big city or something like that. Or like you can affect more change. And, um, I don't know. I just, that's, I, there's a lot of that that sort of resonates with me. So I just, yeah. No, it's definitely true. I feel like connections to people to me feel like the most honest, real way of, of creating positive change. And I, I also studied environmental science and have been thinking about climate for more than a decade. And um, I honestly think this part of the world is a really livable place, given what's coming our way. And um, I feel like if everybody leaves and this place isn't ready, I think a lot of people are going to be moving here. Mm in the yeah. next years and yep. wouldn't it be great to be part of making it a really vibrant community right not that it is it already is a vibrant community but right. not a, not a ton of young people yeah um but i mean i've met at least 10 people in the last year who've moved to this region because it was too hot where they were before or they were, mm-hmm. it was f- being flooded where they were before um yep. or they live near the coast and they were worried about sea level rise and we have a pretty livable climate right now. And that's and that's something else that I actually... That com- matters to me. <laughs> right. And this was actually something that I think I talked about in one of the very first live streams that I ever did yeah. for this channel, where I actually was like... Oh, I, I was talking about the... Um, the fires in the Amazon because yeah. it was like... That was like when the news was really like breaking that that was going on. I was like, okay. Yeah. So the one thing I wanted to do was sort of be like, hey, here's what this will look like here. And Mm -hmm. something I pointed out right away is that, like, it's going to look a lot more like Maryland or, like, South Carolina here. Yeah. Um, And, and like, that that was sort of the... I, I didn't say it at the time, but that's a really, like, the next point to make is, like, this will become a place where people, like, we will have climate refugees here. Yeah. Within the next... 15 years we will see climate refugees showing up to this area and like I think there's a lot of them that will like will be very very not like what we're used to here in terms of they're probably not going to be a whole bunch of white people yeah and that's going to be a huge yeah it's (laughs) right but it's uh, yeah I I, please please. but um (laughs) but the point is is it's like you're looking at some serious demographic changes and your point to like we need to do yeah. the things to prepare for that now. Oh, um, no. That couldn't be more important. <laughs> like, I know, I think you know, it and be not more just important. in environment, and but even in, in terms housing of, like, and grid like, stability. And yep. for the solar project, I mean, not to be totally apocalyptic or whatever. Right, but but if we do install this solar project, and if we do have some lo- level of battery backup, then the school could be a place that could be a shelter in right. a case where something happens, some big storm or whatever, and we're yep. out of power for two or so weeks. Like well, I mean, we look at before. the ice storm that happened exactly. in, what was it, 2009, I want to yeah. say? Yeah, the, um, like, 2008, 2009 ice storm. That yeah. was, like... Right. So the the school could be, a like, a community place yep. that has power at a time where there might be outages elsewhere. So um, I think it's important to have certain places in the community that are equipped to have renewables and to be a safe place if and when something like that happens. Awesome. It, it's great to have it yeah. regardless. But <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's also, that's just good for everybody to kind of think yeah. like, hey, there's a lot more ways that having right. this solar array on the school helps than the just whole community. like, you know, yeah. saving a dime here or getting to put on like a green badge of honor or whatever. It's right. like, there's, there's a lot of pluses yeah. to that. Yeah. So. And it's not a done deal. Right. So in March, it's going to be on um, 
on the ballot. Yep. So that means that we have nine. We have just a few months to organize nine towns. Okay. Um, and try to get out the vote in all the sure. nine towns to so, support this. And so, that was that was the last, the very very <laughs> last thing is um, is what's what can people do to to take action and make this happen over the next few months? Yeah. So talk to your friends about it. Learn. Try to learn more about it. Um, we're sort of putting together more information about the numbers. Okay. Um, we won't have that till after the letter of intent's been negotiated and re revisions come back with a final mm -hmm. um, proposal. Sure. But um, we sort of know the broad brushstrokes already. Yep. And so we can be getting excited about that. And um, there's a climate club at Conval. Awesome. With I think 40 or so students, which is <laughs> great to hear about. I was really thrilled when I heard about that. So they're going to be helping us try to um, educate the community ab awesome. about this project. Um, but we're hoping to have letters in the, to the editor about it in the ledger transcript. But we're hoping to just flood them. Just, just, just flood them. Flood it and talk just, about just it and right, have people be really right excited. Oh my gosh, so, I go off on this right, <laughs> into like, right into the paper. Right into the paper. Talk to your neighbors. Um, yeah. Just keep keep your ears open for it because um, when it gets closer, we're going to be trying to flood social media in the area. We're going to try to have everybody talking about it. Yep. Probably have signs about it. Probably have informational sessions about it. Um, so there'll be lots of ways to learn all of the details if you want to. But cool. Um, yeah. Awesome. I'm, I'm just hoping that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that it it's passes, a, it's a big hope. But I think I mean, but at the same time, I think it's. I think all of the groundwork's been set, and it's a really solid foundation. And having the school board vote last week was really huge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and it sounds like going down the line, you guys have some solid plans in place. So, is there now? Is, when you say social media, is there anywhere that people can follow you guys or oh. like you guys? Anything like that on Facebook or Twitter? We don't have anything yet. Okay. But we probably should. <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> I, no, no, that's fine. Um, let me know when you get it, and okay. you know when we when this goes up, we'll put it in the description so everybody yeah. can follow the links. And fabulous, awesome. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you Great. so much for like taking oh, the time you're to so come. Welcome. And, and... Well, it's been fun this evening, folks. Really enjoyed doing this new format. I hope folks like it too. This stuff will all get chopped up later on and put up as individual videos so nobody has to worry. We'll also be getting the majority of the Valensky event up. I do want people to be able to see that and to be able to sift through it. I don't want everyone to have to just rely off the clips that I posted in tonight's episode. Uh, however, I also... I owe my patrons, and so they're going to get it first. They'll get it for the first week, and then once that week is passed, I'll, I'll put it up next week for everybody. So look forward to that then. And um, yeah, so we'll be back on December 5th, and we will see you then, folks. Take care. <laughs>